Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Got XRB up here on the charts at uh, 39.2. Guys, we're not seeing, uh, you know, too much movement in crypto. I feel like there's so much going on right now. The market is being apprehensive. We have, in fact, though, seen a bit of movement for Bitcoin. Now, yesterday I was talking about uh, Bitcoin forming what was looking like that bullish pennant pattern. And uh, sure enough, it has kind of broken out of that range. So Bitcoin right now trading at about $17,300. As I was saying, though, uh, you know, by and large, we aren't really seeing too much movement in the crypto space market cap, still hovering at that $800 billion mark and Bitcoin dominance staying relatively steady as well. Um, you guys can see in the last 24 hours, we are seeing little bits of movement here or there, although nothing really to write home about. So Bitcoin has moved a little bit. Obviously, we can't say the same for FTT coin, the native token of the FTX exchange, trading right now at $1.28. And, you know, talking about coins that have seen epic falls over the last year, uh, we got to bring up Luna too. Luna trading at 0 0.000176. When, uh, you know, right at the beginning of May, late April and May, it was trading at uh, nearly $80 per coin. Two huge collapse in cryptos uh, that we've seen over 2022. And I mean, guys, this could still be just the beginning. We could, in fact, see even more implode in a similar fashion. I saw this from Jim Bianco here on Twitter. So Larry let the cat out of the bag. BlackRock doesn't do due diligence. They jump on bandwagons just like everyone else in VC land. This was uh, an interview that Larry Fink did uh, last week, talking a little bit about BlackRock's exposure to FTX. And, um, you know, basically, these guys, at least they're claiming they bought it hook, line and sinker, just like the rest of them. BlackRock had an investment in FTX. $24 million in a fund of funds. $24 million. Yeah, it was, it was in a situ it was not in the core part of our business. Okay, so what do you, what do you think happened there? And, and then I want to talk about the diligence piece of it, because part of what's happening here is there's a lot of people questioning all of these fancy firms that everybody looks right. at, Sequoia, you, others, a, a lot of people invested in this company. Mm -hmm. And it appears that nobody was minding the store. Well, I think people are minding the stores. The question is, you know, I'm not, we're going to have to wait and see and how this all plays out. I mean, right now we can make all the judgment calls that it, it looks like there were some misbehaviors of, of major consequences. Uh, I, you know, I am, I assume, look at, by the long, if you look at the sequoias of the world, they've had unbelievable returns over a long period of time. I am sure they did the due diligence. Could they have been misled? Could they have done other things? Could we have been misled in the small little investments we did? Sure, but until we have more facts, I'm not right. going to speculate. I feel like it'd be pretty hard to mislead uh, BlackRock considering they basically run everything. Larry Fink, though, you know, trying to put out a plausible enough story, though, for us. Do you guys believe it? Bill Ackman here coming out on Twitter saying, you know, the problem with the current state of crypto custody is that custodians do not need to commit fraud for all your assets to be wiped out due to the failure of the custodian. So, you know, essentially, if an exchange like FTX goes bust and you, um, you know, had your crypto on said exchange, that's one thing. But, uh, you know, there are a multitude of reasons for cryptocurrency exchanges to go bust. Um, I think what he's saying in not so many words is always keep your cryptocurrency safe on a self-custody storage solution like a Ledger Nano or something similar. Uh, Brian Armstrong, you know, down here saying, you know, that's not necessarily the case with Coinbase and many other custodians preaching that they have always uh, protected consumer funds, both uh, legally and physically. Our retail user agreement highlights the applicability of UCC Article 8. Uh, Ari Paul down here also saying, hi, Bill. We do have regulated crypto custodians in the U.S. like Anchorage, for example. As with FTX, though, it's criminal fraud. If they were to transfer customer deposits to themselves, since their contracts, TOS, and public statements all contain commitments not to, uh, FTX was not a regulated custodian, so there are some differences there. And some other people down here uh, also uh, just mentioning self-custody, including Pascal Gauthier from Ledger themselves. Hey man, I think it would be best if you did more research before making such claims. Ledger has all you need. Check our enterprise website to see the kind of tech that already exists to solve security and governance. And I mean, if you guys still have your cryptocurrency on an exchange, uh, I do have the affiliate link for the Ledger in the description of the video. You can use it if you want. You don't have to use it. This has become a big, um, a big issue. These exchanges can go bust for many different reasons. We know the narrative uh, for FTX has been, you know, massaged and groomed in a way. 
to try to take the blame off of SBF. And so what Bill is in fact saying here is that, you know, there are many different reasons for um, crypto exchanges to go bust. I don't know if he is in fact also uh, supporting that same narrative. Michael Branch posting this. So Anna Sorokin, she says Sam Bankman frieds media apology tour is a scam. Now, uh, I haven't seen this Netflix uh, documentary, but apparently she was the subject of a Netflix um, limited series. It wasn't actually a documentary. It was a limited series, Inventing Anna. She is, in fact, a convicted scammer, and she says that Sam Bankman-Fried's media apology tour is insincere garbage. He's just trying to save himself, she says. Uh, she told the insider this last week. That would be his defense if he is going to get prosecuted. I didn't know Alameda was over leveraged, which is a crazy effing claim that it's his girlfriend's fault. Uh, you can see the seeds of that already ready. So takes one to no one, I guess. Elon Musk added his two cents to the mix here. This one from DJ Peter Vass. Uh, Elon Musk says Sam Bankman Freed should go to prison. Let's give him an adult timeout in the big house. Calls for the arrest of Sam Bankman Freed, founder of tainted cryptocurrency exchange FTX, has been growing louder. And on Saturday, Elon Musk joined the chorus. So when Devin Simonson, an entrepreneur, tweeted that SBF doesn't need any more mentioning except for his court date, Musk chimed in and said he concurs with him. Agreed, let's just give him an adult timeout in the big house and move on, the billionaire said. So, you know, more celebrities are coming out and giving their um, opinions on uh, FTX, what should happen to him. Um, and then, you know, like I've been saying before, like I think we've all been noticing, the media is massaging this in a way uh, to almost give him like a get out of jail free pass. We know the history, we know the connection, we know who his parents are connected to, we know who he donated to. And so now the question becomes, how is this all going to shake out? Considering what we know, um, and it's going to be very, very hard, I think, in this case, to pull the wool over the public's eyes, especially those in the crypto community. Uh, people in the crypto community have the most on the line. You know, all these companies that are trying to develop cryptocurrency related projects uh, for a new future for finance, for, uh, you know, all different kinds of applications. Their livelihoods are essentially on the line. And some are assuming, you know, FTX, the American government, all in on a conspiracy to, in fact, crash cryptocurrency so that, uh, you know, the big banks can get regulated by government first and leave everybody out in the cold. Um, Elon Musk just recently, too, uh, came out on a Twitter space is essentially, uh, you know, restating what he was stating before about wanting to make Twitter a, uh, a payment platform as well as a, uh, well, multi-use platform. Anyway, here's a clip from a recent Twitter spaces Elon Musk joined uh, over the weekend. I've got a question here. I'll give it to Tom just by a pretty notable person that doesn't want to disclose their identity, but it's a simple question. Uh, by the way, anyone that has a question, you could DM me. The team is checking all the DMs. The question is um, plans for crypto Twitter payments, whether it's going to be like WeChat or whether you have uh, you have plans at all. Dogecoin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, hell yeah, Dogecoin um, to the moon. <laughs> Doge to the moon. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. We, we do want to ha have Twitter um, en enable both uh, regular payments and uh, you know, fiat currency. Uh, and and um, and and make make it easier to transact with crypto. Yeah. So just reaffirming what we have uh, heard Elon Musk say before, essentially wanting to make Twitter a platform that will be able to eventually send fiat payments, but also be able to interact with cryptocurrencies, which I think personally is going to be the bigger part of this. Now, Charles Hoskinson also came out and explains why he thinks Doge and get this, BNB coin are going to be part of Elon Musk's Twitter platform. So just real quickly here, uh, just kind of with regards to the more real world utility aspect, Charles Hoskinson predicted that Elon Musk's Twitter takeover could bring an additional 200 million users into the cryptocurrency space and speculated that the CEO and Tesla and SpaceX uh, founder could use his favorite cryptocurrency Doge on the platform. He even said it would be a lot of fun to make a Doge sidechain on Cardano uh, or to build a bridge between the two projects to help the meme inspired cryptocurrency scale because right now it would be very difficult for it to scale. Where BNB comes in though, he also speculated that Binance's $500 million investment into Musk's Twitter buyout had something to do with the exchange looking to support the social media platform when it came to its cryptocurrency integration. Hoskinson said, I don't have any information on it, uh, but if I had to guess, I think that's what Binance is pushing for. You put a half billion dollars into it, and that's a pretty big check size uh, if it's just a passive investment. I think there's every intention to be part of the crypto conversation there. 
So we don't know. It is pure speculation coming from Charles Hoskinson of Cardano. But another interesting connection there, uh, if when Elon Musk does in fact do this, I mean, there is also uh, the rumbling that he could actually integrate the XRPL and the technology is already there. Uh, Elon Musk and his uh, partner, Peter Thiel, in the PayPal days, there is some evidence that they're already holding some XRP. I did a video on that a few months ago. I'll link it up here in the top right hand corner. So, you know, the speculation is wild. And so why on earth is Caroline Ellison in New York City when she was supposed to be in Hong Kong? So this is people on crypto Twitter going crazy. Please confirm a user claims that they spotted Caroline Ellison at a ground support coffee on West Broad in Soho, Manhattan at 8.15 a.m. This would mean she is not in Hong Kong and in New York City, not in custody. And, uh, you know, that looks exactly like Carolyn Ellison or Caroline Ellison. And so, you know, this has got crypto Twitter speculating, uh, and it has been confirmed here. The barista behind the counter has confirmed that it is, in fact, Caroline Elliston. This is from Daniel Matando. If you guys uh, just take a look at him, that's the guy behind the counter. Apparently, he is a barista. And uh, if you just go back up here, that is apparently this gentleman here. So he has confirmed that this is, in fact, uh, Caroline Ellison. Are you behind the counter in the photograph? I am not. That is one of my staff members. Oh, okay. So sorry. It is not him. Sorry. It is one of his staff members, although he apparently does work at that coffee shop. So some are speculating. Here are what the rumors are coming from Michael Branch here. Rumors are now swirling that Ellison may testify against SBF, former Alameda CEO citing in New York City. Obviously, this has gotten the speculation level up in the crypto space. Uh, former CEO of the bankrupt uh, FTX crypto exchange, Sam Bankman fried has always been speaking out publicly as of late. Uh, the crypto community and lawmakers want answers regarding alleged fraud. U.S. Representative Maxine Waters encouraged Bankman fried to appear at a scheduled U.S. House Committee on Financial Services on uh, December 13th to discuss what happened. And uh, as we were mentioning earlier in the, in the video, you know, Sam is on this apology tour and, you know, we're all trying to kind of figure out why is, you know, why, why is government letting him get away with this? And uh, I think because we have already kind of, uh, you know, figured out his connection, his parents' connections to the government and to, um, you know, legal regulatory bodies, we're all kind of figuring here that they're purposely not coming down hard on him for these reasons. So this conversation stirred some reactions across trip, uh, crypto Twitter. Despite his multiple appearances on virtual mediums, most have criticized Sam Bankman-Fried for his unintentional accounting errors. Um, blockchain head of policy and U.S. attorney Jake Chervinsky, okay, he says, translation, he doesn't mind lying to Andrew Ross Sorkin or George Stephanopoulos, but lying to Congress under oath is less appealing. Then this article goes into the Caroline Ellison sighting. Down here, speculation has run amok on SBF, but little was heard about Carolyn Ellison until now. Twitter has confirmed that uh, a user has spotted her at that coffee house in, in Manhattan, as I mentioned before. Photo here, yet again. And at the time of this publishing, these uh, claims were still unverified, but uh, I think now we have, in fact, verified that that is Carolyn Ellison. The cafe in question is coincidentally near the U.S. Attorney's Office and the New York FBI headquarters, only a 21-minute walk away. So also an interesting uh, piece of the puzzle there. These claims are all unconfirmed in conjuncture at this point. Rumors of an SBF Ellison love affair have also swirled, with some claiming that it may have been part of the downfall of FTX. So the drama continues, guys. And, you know, I kind of wanted to focus, um, you know, more on the structure of FTX. There's a lot of evidence as well suggesting that, uh, you know, these guys, namely Sam Bankman fried Caroline Ellison, and, uh, you know, all their friends that were uh, running this company were essentially not responsible for the ultimate demise of the company, the structuring of the company, and that somebody higher up actually structured this company for a purposeful implosion. And here's just, you know, another piece of evidence suggesting the people at FTX really just didn't know what they were doing. This from Sento Sumo Saba here on Twitter, the co-CEO of Alameda on trading Dogecoin. How did you know when the right time was to take profits? Well, it's really just kind of guessing. Elon decided that Doge was his like favorite coin in the world or something. Uh, we later find out that uh, apparently that was because his son really liked it. Uh, <laughs> and he would like trade it with his son or something like that. I don't, I don't really remember, but he uh, he said that like months after all this happened. Um, uh, but yeah, so Elon decided that Doge is like hilarious and like uh, a great thing to, to be tweeting about all the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, so like it... Uh, like he was uh, very much having price impact with his tweets uh, and 
uh, you know, like, uh, the, 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 the thing that I've said in the, in the past is that, uh, uh, like, you know, once he's done this like twice, uh, the probability that he's going to do it like 10 more times, uh, has like this sort of skyrockets. Uh, so it just becomes really likely that he's going to keep doing this. It's possible that he doesn't, uh, in which case it's like sort of likely that the price of Joe just kind of slowly trickles down because he's, you know, had some positive impact. Uh, but if he does keep tweeting about it, it just sort of seemed like it was going to 50 X or something like that. If you sort of arrive at that decision um, and you realize, okay, we're going to take some directional exposure here. Do you scale into it or is it like it's as low as we think it's going to get? Let's go hard. How, how, how does that side of the decision process work? Uh -huh. This is actually something we've screwed up. Uh, we used to screw up a lot. Yeah. So that's, I guess, where the conviction comes from. It's not exactly conviction even. Uh, like it's not like I believed uh, in, uh, in the <laughs> fundamental or anything at any point. Um, but yeah, I certainly believed in the uh, in the fundamentals of uh, Elon sort of continuing on whatever trajectory he was on. <laughs> How do you know when is the right time to take profit and like not lose out on all the potential expected value? Yeah, it's like it's sort of all intuition. Uh, it was quite unprecedented, um, and so it was all. It, it's really just kind of guessing. So basically, you've got traders, uh, you know, trading for a multi-billion-dollar company with a strategy that is worse than most unsophisticated retail traders on crypto Twitter. I think that that uh, pretty much sums this clip up um, very succinctly. It's really just kind of guessing? Are you kidding me? Well, Mark Yusko, the founder, CEO, and chief investment officer of Morgan Creep Capital, I think he spells it out very clearly to the point that uh, these guys weren't really the brains behind the operation. Another great clip here from Sento Sumo Saba on Twitter. The guy who came in to clean up the mess, that it was a bigger mess than Enron, right? less controls, worse accounting, more fraud. Okay, Enron was a pretty big mess. Um, so this is worse than that. I'll argue that, you know, after watching a lot of content from, from Sam and Caroline, they're not the masterminds. No, no chance of that. So mm. uh, I don't think this was neglect. I don't think this was uh, a mistake. Uh, I think this was cold, calculated, uh, intentional destruction uh, by you know somebody much higher up in in the food chain, and these two are useful idiots, uh, and I use that term intentionally. Caroline and Sam Bankman Freed, just useful idiots in a bigger ploy. Now the clip ends there, so we don't actually know what he um, what, what he's what he means. Uh, you know, as this bigger reason why they would be useful idiots, as he puts it, to create such an elaborate scheme. Um, you know, Sam isn't just a fraud. This coming from John Deaton here, liar and a thief, he goes on to say. He is the embodiment of evil. On top of that, he's a really bad actor. His claims of being remorseful and being deeply sorry are genuinely insincere. So, you know, again, like I said, a lot of people aren't buying the charade. This is a reaction to uh, Bitcoin Archive's tweet here. SBF claims little knowledge of Alameda operations, despite owning 90% of it. Guys, it's not adding up. People aren't falling for it. He is getting called out by, uh, you know, many people who have invested in cryptocurrency. Of course, there are, you know, some like um, Kevin O'Leary, who is sticking to the script, despite making a bad investment. Uh, you know, same with, uh, I think, same with Larry Fink, uh, you know, that clip that I showed you guys at the top of the video. And so did FTX have a master plan? Well, Linda P. Jones breaks it down. She says they did. They were in the middle of implementing the big takeover. Having worked at Jane Street, SBF saw how payments and work order flows, or PFOF, is a license to charge a toll to everyone buying stocks. Like a toll bridge to cross, you must pay. She goes on to say, you redirect the trade orders for stocks uh, to your toll booth and collect guaranteed profits without any risk. Ken Griffin, CEO of Citadel, admitted under oath during congressional testimony that currently 40% of all stock trades go through Citadel. Uh, PFOF, that is 40%. And there is some uh, supporting evidence here, a screen grab, just uh, to state that SBF bought part ownership in uh, part ownership in Robinhood, a firm that makes 80% from PFOF through Citadel. This plan was to put Robinhood out of business and control PFOF for stocks and the crypto market. 
Last spring, when I tweeted that SBF was going to bring PFOF to crypto, CNBC came on several minutes later denying that SBF was going to use PFOF. So that's interesting. Uh, they said it would be doing the trades for free. They had to cover for them until he could gain market share and then turn on PFOF. Businesses don't operate for free, at least not very long if they do. Sam and his partners were planning to take over all stock in crypto trading and make guaranteed profits with PFOF, a license to print money from all trades, the Everything Financial app. Their partners joined without doing any due diligence, i.e. Larry Fink at the top of the video, or looking at any FTX financials. And I guess what Linda P. Jones is insinuating here is that because they were all in on it, they did not have to do the due diligence uh, because they knew what the greater plan was going to be. With SBF making massive political donations, they gave themselves cover. It was a done deal. The partners wanted in. But Sam and Caroline were careless. They used customer funds, made bad trades, and got themselves in financial trouble. When markets collapsed, they needed liquidity. They approached people for funds when CZ went public that there was no deal. A run on FTX started, and that was... In fact, game over. Crypto exchange FTX launches free stock trading without payment for order flow with eye towards becoming an everything app. So that is Linda P. Jones's uh, theory here on this. I think it certainly does go, um, well, I mean, I, I, I think it's it's fairly clear. The evidence does point towards the fact that uh, this definitely goes deeper than what we are seeing on the surface. And Chamath Palipatia here, I think sums up this situation quite nicely. This one courtesy of Nerd Nation Unbox on Twitter. Listen to this. Now you look at SPF, it's the exact opposite. He went to the perfect elite private high school. Then he went to one of the most prestigious elite private universities. MIT. His parents teach governance of all things at one of the most elite liberal institutions in America. Stanford. They are in the establishment of the progressive left. And what happened was he took customer funds and all of this money. He made tens of millions of dollars of political donations. He wrapped himself in this blanket of a progressive left-leaning cause called effective altruism. And all of the mainstream media fell for it and embraced him, as well as some politicians, because it met everything that they themselves also bought into. Yes. And now you have this cataclysmic event a multi deca billion dollar fraud or bankruptcy, millions of customer accounts who are frozen, you know, tens of millions to hundreds of millions to billions of dollars lost and stolen from them. And they refuse to re-underwrite this kid. And the reason is because in order to do so, it's like eating your own tail. And that's why they don't want to do it. And so this is why you have the media basically allowing him to do an apology tour. Now, this is his second time at manipulating them. The first time he was able to manipulate them by basically being one of them. And now he's allowing them and their desire to basically protect themselves so that he can create some kind of a defense for himself. And I just think the whole thing is gross because it misses the entire mood of the nation. This is an enormous financial fraud that was perpetrated on tens of millions of people. And there's no accountability because in order to do so, the media would effectively have to admit that they missed it and they got it wrong and they refused to do it. And I think like that is the really big problem that nobody is really speaking out about is like, well, if these folks are meant to be the last stop to make sure that there's truth and honesty and transparency in society, and you can't count on them, and in fact, they're just going to reflect their own narrative. What is one supposed to do to learn the truth? I mean, I would actually take it one step further and um, perhaps suggest that the media was also in on it, considering who we know does control the media and that uh, they're not actually just trying to save face. I don't think the media has a problem with uh, admitting they are wrong if they were in fact duped. I think this apology tour is all a scam. As Anna Sororkin puts it, Takes a scammer to know a scammer. That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.